good to see everybody tonight. Appreciate so very, very much your presence. We are thankful that you are able to be with us tonight, and we pray that we'll be able to do a continuation of some of the comments that we made this morning that can truly be a benefit to us as we try to talk a little bit more about the practice of pure religion. We were looking at James chapter 1 and verse 27, in which James helps us to understand that a couple of focus points in that would be the idea of our helping the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. And so we wanted to do a little focusing on the first part of that comment in that verse, the idea of visiting the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. And as we tried to illustrate this morning, maybe didn't say it as clearly as we might like, that's a whole lot more than passing them in the yard and waving and saying, I'm hoping you're having a good day. But rather instead, as we look to what is actually involved here in striving to help these individuals who are in a distressful situation, there are a lot of things that we might review that we can do to be of help to the fatherless and the widows. You know, there's all kinds of circumstances that can put people in that category. Oftentimes, spouses are lost to accidents and to illness. Of course, we live at a time when those who work as first responders sometimes pay an ultimate price for doing that. We have individuals as well who are in the military that find themselves, you know, being scattered all over the world. Lives are lost in that regard as well. And so there are a whole variety of circumstances that can place individuals in this hardship position of not having anyone turn to. We have a lot of social programs in our country, which is one of the great blessings. It's not discussed very much. The idea of what can be done to be supportive to those in our society that are struggling. And we want to look at, we started going through this this morning, at ways in which we can apply ourselves in doing what we can to be of help to those who are in this distress category, the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. The first thing that we noticed this morning was the idea that these single moms need tremendous support and encouragement. God's original design had a man and a woman together in the working of the rearing of children. And whenever we look at the component parts to that, there's a unique set skill set and attitudes and certain intuitions that mom brings to the table, and there are certain skills and intuitions and know-how that the father brings to the table. And all of this unit together comprises the home unit that is talked about as we get into the opening chapter into the book of Genesis and see the home as God would have it. And whenever part of that is missing, hardship is going to be the result. And as we tried to mention this morning, there is a great need for encouragement to help those who are in this situation to realize that they are loved, that there are those here who want to uphold their hands in the good work that they are trying to do in bringing up their children and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And we should stand ready to help out in every way that we can. Oftentimes, even chores around the house, there are certain maybe repairs or other kinds of things that need to be taken care of that oftentimes maybe mom doesn't have those, attitude, those uh, aptitudes to be able to, to fix the car or to repair the broken window or whatever else needs to be done. And so our being aware of those needs and helping out in that regard is yet another way that we can be supportive to the single moms and help bear their burdens as Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2 teaches us. We also notice that we are all adopted children of God, according to what Paul taught the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5, as we look to those who have committed themselves to following Jesus Christ. This was the plan of God, that we could be pulled into that situation, that we could be adopted into the family of God, and that we would then have that opportunity to do what we can in striving to expand the borders of the kingdom and to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and to be all that we can be in God's service. In many situations, it is in that spiritual family that many men begin to find something out about how to be the right kind of father. 
both instruction from the scriptures, showing them how to be the head of their household, helping them to understand the role that God has given them to do. All of this can be found in the pages of God's word, which helps us to see what God wants out of us. But then we also learn something about the, the protective nature of God, the way in which God has provided. We see him as our heavenly father, and we wind up finding a lot of things to model out of the illustration that's given to us in that regard. And so being adopted into his family is truly a wonderful blessing to give us spiritual guidance in this life and help us learn how to live so that heaven can be our home. And so for many families, they find over time their doors can be open to get other children. They can be adopted in. I have had some families that have worked in that role of adoption, and they have had to deal with a lot of adversities and, and hardships. It's not necessarily the easiest route for a person to follow. But at the same time, while it may be expensive, it may be difficult, there may be many challenges that you have to face, that doesn't deal the importance of attempting to do what we can to help others, other children to grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so that is another way we can help the fatherless as to become those parents that can lead and can help and to can help those children one day know the Lord and be obedient unto his will and live faithfully unto death. We also notice this morning that children need to have people who will take an interest in them. Some have used the expression down through the years, it takes a, a village to raise a child. The one borrowing point from that, that that I have found has been that oftentimes it is greatly appreciated when there are other folks who take interest in children and help them to achieve their, their potential. And this is especially true with the fatherless. Maybe it's the role of a school teacher as they try to educate them in, in academic affairs. Maybe it's the coaches that try to help them to learn how to cooperate with others and to be able to develop a sense of teamwork, to be able to develop a sense of sportsmanship and some of those other things that don't necessarily give itself conveniently to a, a, an academic classroom or whatever. But in those situations, there are people who take the time to be interested in children, to show that they are supportive of them, to go and to, to uh, attend their events and to be able to cheer them on as they attempt to, to accomplish some things of, of their own in the various pursuits that they may choose in this life. All of those things are greatly appreciated on the part of those who are lacking the support network that many other families have. It's a whole lot more uh, impressive in some respects and in some settings for a child to look out there and see that it's not just mom sitting in the audience, but rather that there are others who love and care about them and want to be there to applaud their successes and to encourage them, to help them understand that there is a bond there. There is a care and concern. There are many children who do not experience that kind of support. They do not have others. They feel like they're fighting this battle alone, that there is no one else who really cares for them. And they feel that there's been a raw deal given to them in this life, and they're angry over that. And as a result, oftentimes their behaviors are not as we would like to see them. We need to help them understand that there are those folks who do care. We noticed this morning the example of how the Apostle Paul devoted time to helping taught Timothy and helping Titus and others to, to develop into to gospel preachers and to be able to work in the kingdom effectively. He all called Timothy his son in, in the faith. So it was a deep abiding relationship and it's mutually beneficial. Whenever Paul was in prison, as we go over to 2 Timothy, we find that Paul requested that Timothy come to see him and a cloak would really be nice that he had left with somebody in. And the books and parchments he really would like for Timothy to bring to him now that he was in Rome. And so as we are able to build these relationships, we can help young people grow into early adulthood with the right values, with that right sense of community and responsibility within the fellowship of Christians to be able to look and see what their brothers and sisters in Christ need and to realize that as just as they have been helped in their earlier years, it's their turn now to reach out to help others. And so being befriended, 
being encouraged, being helped, like Abraham helped Lot in capacities that he was able to, to do. All of these things are biblically precedented in the scriptures so that we can understand our role in, in that regard. But the big issue as well is understanding that in serving the Lord, Christianity is a taught religion. It's not something just left to uh, our intuitions and feelings, but rather we learn how to serve God by studying his word and following that which is given. Over in Matthew chapter 28, in the great commission that uh, uh, Jesus gave to the apostles before he ascended back to his father, it was one thing to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But the job did not end there. The commission goes on to say, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. We all, as Christians, members of the body of Christ, have a need to constantly be growing in our understanding of what the Bible says. Young people who sometimes are short on teachers at home especially are able to benefit from that as there are others who will invest time and energy in helping them to grow. I remember as a child growing up there was an older woman that sat in front of us at, at the congregation where I grew up and in her own way she found a way to impact me and my spiritual growth at a very young age. She bought me a, a packet of index cards, and she just simply asked me, would I mind taking notes from the sermon that I heard, and to give, make a copy for myself and a copy for her each Sunday. Well, I thought that was a really big, big uh, compliment that she thought I could do such a thing. And so I worked to catch whatever was written on the board or whatever was important points that I could jot down. And I still have that stack of index cards from lessons that I heard preached back when, when I was a youngster. But guess what? I listened. There were things in those sermons I still remember. I wasn't just drawing pictures. I wasn't just wasting my time sitting there, you know, kind of daydreaming and waiting for all this to be over. But rather, I began to relate to what was being presented and how it was being presented and what were the points that were there. And somebody else cared. Somebody else showed appreciation for all that I did. Every now and then she'd say, why don't you spend Sunday afternoon with us? She'd take me out to maybe for a meal or whatever, and we come back to church that Sunday evening. I felt like there was somebody who really cared about my being at services and wanted that experience to be worthwhile for me. And so as you begin to think back about those moments and those people in your lives that helped you from an early age to understand these things that the, that the Lord commanded, we can begin to see the sort of attitude and disposition that we need to have. We noticed this morning from over in Psalm 119, and going down to, to verse 9, the, the psalmist said, Wherewithal with all shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. There's so much to attract our attention in this world that we need as many helping hands as possible to help our young people develop an abiding interest in spiritual things. If it's just a matter of coming and sitting in church, so to speak, and then finally getting to go home to do something fun, over time there is a resentment that tends to grow about the process. So I'll turn an illustration one time to make the point. If you took a, a, a little kid, you know, and or even as an adult, let's move it up to an adult scale, take an adult, put them in a chair where their feet cannot touch the ground, Put them in a box where they cannot see over or around or anything else but besides that box. And then play a tape to them in a foreign language. Exactly how much stuff would you get out of it? And when you take a little tiny kid in services, that's kind of the situation they're in. They can't see over the bench. They haven't developed the command of the English language yet. And some of those activities of the worship service, they're just not quite there yet. But that's a learning process. And we work to make it beneficial for them at whatever level we can. And as they grow then, they can see more of what's going on, the benefits they can gain out of that. And 
oftentimes those conversations that we can have in the car going to and from church, other things that we can say throughout the week, show our interest in spiritual things, that this isn't a Sunday morning only thing for us. And hopefully they will understand the abiding importance of these kinds of things. It is important that we work to get through some of it. There's going to be obstacles, there's going to be challenges, there's going to be things that, that the fatherless have got to face and deal with. Maybe all kids are going to have to a certain extent, but maybe it's going to be even more exaggerated in their cases because often there's not someone there to help curb some of their impulses and help them to see that there is a need to listen and to learn. But then we also talked, as we're leaving off this morning, about the crying need with this being Father's Day in particular. I wanted to focus upon the idea of teaching men to be men. We live in a society that wants to slant, change, or blur the distinctions of what God has given for a man to do. If he becomes uh, assertive in his leadership, I'm not saying unreasonable, I'm not saying abusive, I'm just saying seeing how to attain a goal and taking definite steps in a righteous and reasonable way to get there, there it drives some people crazy. Because you're not supposed to do anything I don't give you permission to do. And if you don't do it the way I think it should be done, then you're wrong. Well, maybe our notions should be improved. Sometimes we have a difficult time being able to watch young people grow and being able to see them develop into maturity and move out on their own in a world that we've tried to prepare them to reach. I've often said that one of the most difficult times for parents is the moment when the kids are leaving home. When they were little, we could say sit there and we could make them sit there. But now as they get older and have more of a mind of their own and are subject to a lot more inferences in their lives, influences in their lives, it becomes more challenging because they may be hearing also voices that are in direct contradiction to some of the instructions given by, by mom. And whenever it's that we're dealing with the fatherless, that's oftentimes the only touchstone that they have are the things that mom would say to them. And so as they begin to, to think about these ideas as children begin to grow up and move off on their own, sometimes we don't want to let them. But we've tried our best to teach and to prepare them. And we need to be there even when, as they move into adulthood, they stumble and fall to pick them up, dust them off, and help them move forward. But at the same time, we oftentimes as adults remember the moments when we moved out and got off on our own. We remember some of the mistakes that we made. We've also remembered some of the victories that we had. But it's all part of the maturing process. And so as we talked about it in our lesson this morning, as we were ending with this point, there is the need for folks to understand how to be sober-minded, how to understand there are priorities, there are things that need to be tended to over in Titus chapter 2. And going to, to verse 6, Paul tells Titus to teach the young men that they should exhort them to be sober-minded, to be able to set goals, to stay focused on those goals and not to give up and run off just because they've had a bad day or something has happened that did not please them or something went contrary to what they expected. I remember one time with our son, Bobby was growing up, he started working for a member of the church who had an interesting way of working with young people. He hired many of the young guys in the church to work in his drywalling business. Now, if you've ever had anything to do with hanging drywall, that is one of the dustiest, nastiest jobs that you may ever want to get involved in. And so the crew that this guy had had some pretty rough and tumble people in it, but he was very successful in his drywall hanging business. But his objective was to help the young guys that came to work for him understand this is not the kind of lifestyle you want to be doing for the rest of your life. And so he didn't really make it easy on them. He was going to make it rather miserable. And 
then screwed up. Bobby worked for about a week and he was done. I ain't going back. He had a couple of tricks pulled on him at work by some of his co-workers and, and it had just not been a pleasant circumstance and he was fed up with it. He was done. And that was one time when dad and son had one of those heart-to-heart -heart sort of talks. I said, I can understand the job is nasty. I can understand if you want to quit. Fine. Go in tomorrow, give your notice, and then bow out gracefully. You're just not going to not show up. Well, Dad, if you just do, I said, you're not just going to fail to show up. And if you need to work out a two-week notice, so be it. You can suck it up and manage for two weeks. <laughs> well, as it worked out, the, the eldest guy, I happened to be an elder of the church where I was preaching at the time. And he kind of smiled when Bobby came in and gave his notice and said, fine, just get your stuff and go on home. He was planning on that to happen, and he wasn't going to make Bobby work through those next two weeks. But Bobby learned a lesson that you still, even though it's a distasteful situation, you handle things according to protocol. You do what's the right thing to do. You show honor and respect to somebody who's been writing you a paycheck for the past several weeks, and did you a favor by even giving you a job. So it's all part of the learning curve. It's all part of the learning process as we learn to be sober-minded. But in that process is also the need to understand that we take on responsibilities as husbands and fathers to tend to families and to provide for them. We have a tremendous problem in our society today of individuals not learning that lesson. They are too reluctant to become biologically a father, but whenever it comes to being there in the real sense of the guide, teacher, and support to a child that they have now fathered, many of them decide, I'm out of here, I just don't want to fool with that. And there is a need to understand that as men we take responsibility for our actions, first of all to guide them in the ways of righteousness and to make sure that we do our best to be the providers that we need to be. Now that doesn't mean that all of a sudden we have to buy into working 24-7 where the Lord gets shut out and everything revolves about how much money we can make so that we can have a bigger house, three cars, and a boat. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is being the provider that Paul talked about in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8. But he said, if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. We have obligations. That is going to be difficult. Oftentimes you've got to put in some extra hours to do difficult things, different things that may not have been your favorite choice, but it's going to need to be done. I remember at one point our girls and Tammy were going to be taking a band trip uh, down to Disney World. And it was a big honor for the band to get chosen for this, but it was going to take some extra money that I didn't have for them to be able to go. And so I made I happened to get hired on at a Little Caesars delivering pizzas. And I'd worked a second job for about six months or so, collected the tips off of that, and I paid for their trip to Disney World. Wasn't fun, especially the night that I locked my keys in the car. <laughs> With the car running nonetheless. You know, there are things that happen. Dog that chased me across the yard, and I got in the car just before its jaws snapped around my leg. You know, you have those interesting moments, but you do what needs to be done. There was one time that was particularly stressful for us financially. I had several guns I was very proud of, but you know what? We needed to eat more than we needed those guns. And so I found buyers for them and made the extra money that was necessary to keep my family floating. That's what providers do. I don't say that to pat myself on the back. I use them as illustration of the fact that whenever it comes to providing for our own, we push the, ourselves to be what God wants us to be. But there's another area of that instruction too. And while it is complicated to talk about, nonetheless the Bible gives us a lot of instruction of husbands. You need to be, now let's back up. We also need to be as the affectionate lovers that God intended us to be. Over in Ephesians at chapter 5, and going down to verse 25, uh, we find
time the Apostle Paul talking about a relationship between Christ and the church, and he compares it to the home situation. He says in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Having a spouse that you love so much that you would be willing to give your life for the sparing of theirs. But the point comes to mind from this passage. <clears throat> Going on down to verse 28. He says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. You know, if folks really, if guys really understood this, we wouldn't have the cases of domestic abuse that so often are in the newspapers. As individuals began to understand, I don't have the right to come in angry over a hard day and take my anger out on my wife and on my kids. We would understand the importance of truly cherishing the wife that we have. After all, out of all the fish in the sea, she chose to marry you, just like you chose to marry her. And with those vows having been exchanged, there is a fidelity that needs to go to them. And that moves us on into another pressing issue that many young people don't get instilled. It's especially difficult, I think, in some households where there's not voices coming from both the male and female side. It is distressing to me to read through the statistics. And when you begin to look at the number of young people who have been involved in sexual activity that wound up with the birth of a child, the statistics are within just a few points of each other of those in the world that never darkened the door of the church those who have grown up in church settings where folks have been teaching and talking to them since the time that they were small about the evils of fornication and the impropriety of sexual activity outside of marriage. Now we talk about it, we preach about it, we discuss it in classes, we have all kinds of contexts in which that is explored, and yet Oftentimes, in looking at young people throughout the community, we see that even those who grew up in a church setting oftentimes fail to measure up to the moral code that is expressed in the scriptures. It's a major problem. And sometimes I wonder if we might need us not been plain enough in making the point that God's word says that you don't go to bed with somebody that's not your wife. And that you need to, as the same thing goes on the other side of the coin, you don't go to bed with somebody who is not your husband. Plain and simple as that. But we live in a society that seems to see that it's just a pleasurable recreation and you do what you want to do. Over in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. Sex was given to us as an urge by God. But we were also given the legitimacy of how that could be handled. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But catch the rest of the verse. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. We've got to understand the moral boundaries that God placed upon the behavior of men and women. Our society doesn't pick up on it, doesn't want to follow it, and is very reluctant to subscribe to it. Oftentimes, it, the teachings that are available throughout the community is, well, we just can't stop people from doing it, so let's just teach them to do it safely. We need to teach people to control themselves. And to understand, yes, there's all kinds of urges, but you got to handle it. An alcoholic may develop a real love affair with the bottle, such that it will destroy his life. But the only way he's going to straighten it out is to get that urge under control. The drug addict has the same challenge. And so just because we have an urge and feel a certain romantic twinge doesn't mean that God's law gets thrown out the window. So that kind of conversation needs to take place. And while it may be a mother or a single parent who's trying their best to make that point, it doesn't 
heard to have it reinforced from the pulpit and from other voices as well, about being proud of the young people who understand the moral code of God and are willing to hold themselves back from such activity until it can be discharged in the proper realm of a marriage bed. But it's sad that so many don't seem to get the message. And so once again, we see the importance of trying to convey the teachings of the Word of God in a, word that is, in a way that is meaningful because that's what we're involved in, is being teachers of God's Word, helping individuals to understand what God's Word says. And notice Ephesians chapter 6 and going down to verse 4. It says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Guys, we've got a job to do in being the spiritual leaders of our families. And oftentimes we fail miserably in that regard. Let mom do it. We have a voice in this too. In helping folks understand there is a difference between right and wrong. And those folks that I'm talking about are own children. And helping them to understand what God's word says. It's not just me as a father or me as the mother trying to harp at you and tell you to do what I tell you to do. I'm echoing what God has said is the way that you need to leave, live your life. Now, in order for that teaching to have impact, there's got to be a respect and a bond there between the teacher and the student. That bond is going to be built by the time that we can spend with our kids and build a communication there where we can talk about whatever and do it with respect and with a way that can bring a good outcome. That requires time and energy that sometimes we're just not willing to sacrifice. As Bobby was growing older, I began to see him getting more and more involved with, you know, the, the athletes of the community and another crowd that many of them were not members of the church. And I began to see some warning signs crop up of some things we might need to talk about, but having an opportunity to do that was a bit of a struggle. But the one lifelong ambition Bobby always had was to study martial arts. And so I said, okay, let's go for it. I found a wonderful teacher that gave a private lesson just to Bobby and I as his rotation of the day. He taught all day long. But he made a spot for Bobby and I. Mike Nye did me in. But nonetheless, Bobby never failed to appreciate those hours that we spent practicing together, the lessons that we took together, and oftentimes in an exhausted state following a group lesson or an individual lesson that had been especially stressful, sometimes over a boat or whatever later, it was amazing some of the conversations we had the opportunity to have. And to be able to build a rapport and a relationship so that whenever I said something, it made sense. He could respect what I was saying because he knew that I cared and we were involved in each other's lives. That's what's involved in being teachers and working in that regard and to be consistent with it. Whenever it says, provoke not your children to wrath, one way to send kids into orbit in a heartbeat is to say it's all right one day, but it's wrong tomorrow. And the next day it might be all right again, but the next day after that it's all wrong again now. That type of inconsistency will drive a sane man crazy and it'll make your, and your kids extremely anxious. Make the rules, live by the rules, consistently and have rules that are from the Word of God. And then finally, financially, there are also going to be situations where we can help the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. There are going to be those times when money does run short and there's no, there's only one person leading that household and she or he or she can only be stretched so far. And so other help may be necessary to support them in their needs. In Galatians chapter 6 and going down to, to verse 10, the once again, the Apostle Paul is talking about individuals 
doing what they need to do. He that soweth of the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, he said. He that soweth of the spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting life. Let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, but especially unto them who are of the household of faith. As we mentioned this morning, that's just not a matter of throwing a check blindly in the wrong direction, but rather as needs arise that can be helped, then we do what we can. Paul talked also to Timothy about what to teach as far as the disposition of members of the, the body of Christ and the, the financial reserves that they have. In first, excuse me, in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17, charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but of the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute and willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now all the way through this, people struggle. And sometimes in the process of that struggle, they make bad decisions. There are some individuals who will want to exploit, take advantage of, are not what they need to be. But that doesn't erase our obligation to try. They may make wrong decisions. They will stand accountable for that. We've got to make responsible decisions and do the best that we know how to do to help the fatherless and the widows and their afflictions as we strive to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. I hope that these two lessons have given us a little insight on this Father's Day about some of the things that are involved as we try to not only live the lives that we need to live as fathers leading families, but how we can be especially sensitive to those who are fatherless and need an extra pair of hands to help out in meaningful ways. That we can see other doors opening as to what we can do to help other folks be strengthened spiritually and to go to heaven when this life is over. That's what it's all about. And that's what we've played with even tonight. That if you're not yet on that road to heaven, having been baptized for the remission of your sins, if there are some steps you need to take tonight to make your life right in the sight of God, we urge you to come as together we stand.